I want to tell you a story about the man who wrote the most famous uh, Christian hymn of all times. It's a song I'm sure you've all heard many, many times. Everybody sings it. It's a story of a, of a man named John Newton, a hero of mine. He was the most famous evangelist in Great Britain back in the 1700s. But he, he wasn't always uh, an evangelist, though. See, before he got saved, he was one wretch of a man, just like he says in the song. See, John Newton, when he was a young lad in the early 1700s, Back in the days of piracy on the high seas, uh, he ran away from home, far away, and he uh, got a job, you know, as a sailor, you know, in a, a slave trading ship. It was back when the slave trade was in full swing. And I started off as a cabin boy. He's probably about 12, 13 years old. You know? And, he, and over the years, he worked his way up the ranks. Then one day, he made, it, he made it all the way up to first mate. That's second in command behind the captain. He was the first mate of his slave trading ship for many years. And, uh... His crew hated him. They feared him. Because he was a vile, foul, vulgar, despicable person. That's what he was. Until he became a new creature in Christ. I have a lot in common with him. So, uh, if I get choked up, I can help. I'm so grateful I'm not the man I used to be. But anyway, his crew couldn't stand him because he was just, he was mean. He was meaner than Judge Jones. Oh yeah, by far. And uh, anyway, the ship he was on had a, had a route, you know, it would leave England. It would sail down the west coast of Africa where... Uh, they would pick up their cargo. Yeah. Human cargo, human trafficking, slavery. They pick up all these slaves on the west coast of Africa, load them on board their ship, and then they'd sail across the Atlantic Ocean to the New World. Uh, this is when e England had uh, colonies in uh, America, the 13 original colonies. But, uh, they never landed on the shores of uh, those colonies. They, they always dropped their cargo off on uh, uh, Dominica, the, the island today called Hispaniola. Uh, it's a big island in the Caribbean. And uh, the left side of the island is Haiti. And the right side of the island is the Dominican Republic. Back then it was just called Dominica. And... Uh, that's where they dropped off all their cargo. That's, that's why there's a lot of black people in Haiti, you know, because they're originally from Africa, uh, you know. And, and, and they would go back and forth between uh, the island of uh, Dominica and the west coast of Africa, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And every now and then they'd shoot up to England and, you know, a little R&R, &R, whatever. And... Uh, I'm sure John Newton enjoyed that R&R &R, because he, he was a drunk. He was a, a severe drunk and a violent one, a mean drunk. He was drunk all the time. He was mean all the time. Uh, Elvis. Let's get back to Amazing Grace, shall we? And, uh, yeah, yeah, he, he was a drunkard. He was a violent man. He, uh, he abused everybody on the ship, uh, 
not only the slaves, but the crew too. But he, uh, as far as the slaves would go, he would rape all the women. He would torture and brutalize all the males. He was just mean. And his crew couldn't stand him. Because, I mean, and, and these were hardened sailors, you know, slave traders. And they couldn't stand this guy. That's how bad he was. And uh, one time, he, you know, I said he was the first mate, second in command of the ship. One time he got into a, uh, an argument with the captain. And the captain said, to heck with it, man. I'm get rid of this guy. And the captain shoved him overboard. This is in the choppy seas, all, you know, way out in the middle of the ocean. And he pushed him overboard. And uh, that would have been the end of John Newton right then and there. But God... Well, he had other plans. There was uh, a guy on board the ship who also didn't like Newton. But God... You know, God makes people do things that, that they just wouldn't normally do if, if it's for the greater good, you know. You know, God uses all kinds of people, good and bad people alike, uh, to do his will. Anyway, one of the guys, the harpoonist, he was a skilled guy with a harpoon, you know, and uh, he took his harpoon and he threw it into the ocean aiming at, at John Newton probably trying to kill him, I don't know, but he threw it at him, and the harpoon hit, hit him in the thigh. Pierced, went all the way through his thigh. I bet that hurt. And then they reeled him in, brought him up, up on board, and uh, when, when they made it back to port in England, uh, they gave him his walking papers and said, get the hell out of here. Well, John Newton, he got a job on another slave trading ship because he liked he liked doing that sort of thing he, he was really into it like I said he was a foul vulgar man you know you think he'd learn a lesson but nah some people some people learn the hard way and some people are a little slow and takes a while I can relate to that uh, but anyway he worked his way up you know well I guess he started off his first mate right away on the second ship but then he eventually he became the captain. Now he's a captain, finally, a sea captain. Still just as drunk and mean as ever, and abusive and violent and cruel as ever. And uh, his crew couldn't stay, his new crew couldn't stand him either. And one day when they were off the coast of Africa, after picking up a fresh shipment of slaves, uh, his crew did a mutiny, and they all ganged up on him. And they threw him overboard. Well, once again, he should have died. But uh, like I said, God had other plans for John Newton. He was washed ashore on the beaches of West Africa. And uh, a bunch of uh, locals, a bunch of natives, exact same type of people that they, they were... You know, learn on board with pancakes and stuff. That's, that's, how, that's, how, that's one of their tricks, how they got them on board. They had fresh pancakes and they lure them on board. They were, you know, evil people. Anyway, these natives came and found John Newton. And they took pity on him. And they, they nursed him back to health, took care of him, took good care of him. And then one day... Another ship came by. And John Newton's out there going, hey, hey, hey. And, uh, and it was a slave trading ship, of course. They came by and they rescued John Newton. And then they took captive all the people that rescued John Newton prior to all the natives. John Newton didn't care. He was a vile dude. Despicable. And then... Uh, Eventually, John Newton, well, As the snow flies, once again, became first mate of that ship. His goal was to be captain again, because he really loved his job. Shut up, Elvis. I don't want to hear you. Oh, this is rock and roll anymore. And, uh, I don't. It's a trigger. Uh, but anyway, um, 
So once again, he's on his third, his third ship, his third crew, doing the same thing. You, you think the guy learned a lesson by now, but you know, hardened heart, stone cold, cruel and mean. And then, and this is in the year 1741, or 1748, excuse me, a huge storm whipped up out of nowhere. Hurricane type storm, I mean bad. And that wooden ship was tossed up and down and the whole crew was in total terror and fear of their lives, including John Newton. John Newton. Well, let me backtrack a little bit. When he was rescued that third time, God was working on his heart. He was start, He was actually starting to have a little bit of a conscience. That's the Holy Spirit. See, God chooses. See, God chooses who, who he wants to uh, live with him one day. He chose me. Anyway, his conscience was bothering him. So when, when the rest of the crew wasn't looking every now and then, he, 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 he started reading the Bible a little bit. But it didn't take long. The devil would get in his head and he'd start drinking again and just start going back to doing what he did. And, uh, well then, let's get back to the storm. 1748. This huge storm. Was tearing that ship apart. It was, she was about ready to go down. With everybody on board. Including all them slaves who were, were uh, chained to the ship. That would have been horrible. Well, John Newton, he threw himself on his knees and he screamed out to God. He said, please, please save me. Save me. Save me. Jesus, if you're real, save me. Boom, just like that. The sea was calm. You know, Jesus does that sort of thing, you know. Just ask uh, Peter when he walks on water, you know. But anyway, the sea was calm, the storm was gone, the sun came out, and a beam, a big sunbeam, just shone down on John Newton. That's what the rest of the crew said. They witnessed it. They couldn't believe it. They all witnessed and experienced a miracle. I witnessed, I witnessed a few of them myself, and and not just the one I told you about when I was in jail. I, I'll make another video. I'll tell you, I'll tell you about another miracle. I, well, I'll tell you at the end of this. Anyway, it was a miracle. John Newton knew right then and there that this book was real, and that God loved him. And he said, "How could you save a wretch like me?" Well, that storm was over, and uh, they sailed over to the cross to the back to the Caribbean, and they. Unloaded their cargo, doing their job. Newton wasn't the captain; he was the first mate. Because Newton, Newton felt really bad about, you know, dropping off his last load of cargo. If you want, you know, the slaves. And uh, the ship then went back to England for their R and R. But this time, when Newton got off the ship, he didn't go out and get drunk, and he didn't return to the ship. He went back home. Like the prodigal son. He went back home to where he came from. By this time, he was in his 40s. He was, he was pretty old back in those days. He left when he was not even a teenager quite yet, and he returned in his 40s. Nobody even remembered him. His family had all been passed away, dead, you know. Uh, but but he, he started going to church and became a pastor. And then he started writing hymns. And he wrote Amazing Grace. See, God knew before John Newton was even born that that was the guy that he had picked in advance to write Amazing Grace and to do great things in the name of God. Even though he did horrible things in the beginning, but hey, just goes to show, no matter how bad you are, 
never too late. It's never too late to get saved. Well, John Newton spent the next 40 years of his life traveling on foot, carrying nothing with him, absolutely nothing with him except the Bible. And he traveled on foot as an evangelist, you know, like Billy Graham, you know, he was an evangelist. And he preached, and he preached mighty and hard. And he wrote hymns, Christian hymns. Then one day he died. Now here's the cool part. It always brings me tears. There's a cemetery in England today. And uh, I had no idea I was going to be making this video, by the way. I just, it just, just spurred the moment, it hit me. Or I have maybe prepared be able to tell you where you could find this cemetery because it still exists and uh, I love going to old cemeteries you, you know around the area you know where they got all the Civil War graves and, and uh, you can you can barely read them some of them you can't read because because the inscriptions are all weathered away from the years well this is a cemetery from the 1700s and uh, there are hundreds and hundreds of, of graves and tombstones in there all of them with inscriptions on them and all of them are worn off through the years none of them are legible except for one and it's perfectly legible as if it was written just 50 years ago or so you still read it plain as day and that tombstone says Bear with me here. Always chokes me up. That tombstone says, Here lies John Newton, a great sinner, saved by the grace of God. True story. True story. One of my favorite stories. I used to like telling this story a long time ago, back when I was still living a sinful lifestyle, thinking I was saved, but I really wasn't. Well, I'm saved now. I was a great sinner. And I've done bad things. I've done terrible things. I lived a horrible life. A life of sin. But today, I am saved by the grace of God. Saved by the grace of God. Let's get my whip riches of Christ here, shall we? I want to show you a, a word, a D word. My old uh, YouTube show, I used to refer to myself as a dastardly dude of debauchery. Well, today, I have been delivered from the dominion of darkness. I am a new creature in Christ. Yeah, what happened to John Newton, all those events he experienced, those are miracles. I've had a few miracles myself. God, God, God saved, saved me from a lot of stuff, too. Uh, I can think of several of them, most of which I had forgotten up until recently. It's amazing how the devil can do that to you. Let me tell you about just, just one of these miracles, kind of give you an idea of what kind of person I used to be. Back in uh, 1991... I was uh, living in California, out in San Jose, California, and uh, I had just stolen a car, and uh, I was driving from uh, from San Francisco. I drove up to San Francisco because I wanted to go across the Golden Gate. One of my starting points to be the Golden Gate Bridge. If they'd had cell phones back in the day, I'd have done. That'd have been one of my many bridge bridge videos. Uh, I was always planning on uh, continuing my show and going out there. Uh, as soon as I got off probation, I was going to head out there. As a matter of fact, that was my every intention. But God had other God had other plans. But anyway, so I started off on the Golden Gate Bridge, and, and my destination was Atlanta, Georgia, to go work for my millionaire uncle, who later on disowned me because I was a wretch, because I was a drunk, I was an alcoholic, and he fired me. But anyway, I was on my way in this uh, 1978 uh, Camaro I had. 
really cool car. It's all white with blue racing stripes down the side, fin tail on the back, blue leather interior. And, uh, yeah, wasn't mine, but I took it anyway. And uh, as I was traveling across the country, I, I, I had a, uh, a revolver, a Saturday night special. It's a uh, 38 Saturday night special. I wanted to get a 357 Magnum, but uh, that's, that was all I could manage to get my, my greedy little hands on. But I, I had me a you know, Saturday night special. I used to listen to that song uh, all the time by Leonard Skinner. Uh, and during the course of my uh, road trip, you know, I uh, went through uh, Las Vegas. You know, I went across the Hoover Dam. I went through Las Vegas. Had some troubles in Vegas, some misadventures there. Barely got out with, by the skin of my teeth. And uh, then I'm uh, driving through Arizona. I get pulled over by the police there. I just had a bunch of drugs on me. Uh, um, I was under the influence of mescal. I was eating a bunch of little mescaline tab tablets, kind of like LSD. And I was high on mescaline. Had a big, big bag of marijuana, and, you know, and passenger seat. This is 1991. Uh, had a can of Budweiser in my hand, open drinking it and I had that Saturday night special that revolver uh, tucked you, you, you know I had, well, I had it set down next to me when I got pulled over high as, high as you know out of blown out of my mind and I had uh, the rest of the mescaline I probably had about 17 18 hits on me in my pocket cop pulls me over for speeding I get out and I take my gun with me and I put it behind my waistband, put my shirt over it, so thinking he can't see it. Amazing thing was, he couldn't. He didn't see anything. He didn't see the can of beer I had in my hand as I'm standing out talking to him. He, you know, patted me down, checked me out, asked for my license, didn't even notice the gun, didn't notice the marijuana. And it was right there, right straight in front of his face. And I'm thinking, what is going on here? You know what, what? You know why is why is he not arresting me? You know, and, and he just said, "Do you know how fast you were going?" Blah blah blah. And he goes, "I'm just. Uh, I should arrest you. You're driving so fast. I don't remember how fast I was doing. I think I was doing close to a hundred miles an hour." And he wrote me a speeding ticket, uh, which I never paid, by the way, and don't have a warrant for my arrest in Arizona because I checked and uh, that just slipped through the cracks. And uh, he let me go. I climbed back in the car, still with the can of beer in my hand, and I just drove off. Then I got to uh, New Mexico, Albuquerque, New Mexico. Now, I was having a lot of car problems. I think the transmission was going out. Uh, yeah, was, by the time I got into Albuquerque, uh, you know, about 40 miles west of Albuquerque, the car was... <laughs> You know, but, but I made it in. I made it into Albuquerque to the Greyhound bus station. I had a destination in Atlanta, Georgia. So, uh, and I had a little bit of money left from, you know, I didn't lose it all in Vegas. I, I still I still had a little bit left, but not enough for a one-way bus ticket from Albuquerque to Atlanta. They were wanting to charge me $130. I didn't even have anywhere near that amount. Hi, me, Elvis. Oh. Uh, didn't even have, got to remember how much I had, but it wasn't much. And, uh, I thought, what am I going to do now? And so I thought, well, I got this gun. Could do what I usually do. But instead, uh, some woman from my past, I'm going to ignore her. I don't do toxic relationships anymore. I avoid, I, I avoid evil these days. I just, I'm associated, yeah, I keep, anyway, get back to my story. Um, I took that gun, I went to a pawn shop and tried to pawn it. You know, I was gonna pawn it. But it was a Sunday. 
the pawn shop is closed. And I thought, oh, well, well, I guess I'll just car camp, you know, no stranger to that. I'll just car camp in the parking lot at the Greyhound bus station. So I go back to the Greyhound bus station. And uh, as I'm walking back to my car, uh, no, no, I, I go back to my car. And then I go inside the, the bus station. I'm inside the bus station, as I recall, because I was going to sit down, get in the air conditioning and stuff. And the uh, bus station was packed full of people. This man walks up to me out of nowhere. He says, excuse me. He says, uh, I want to buy your gun. I'm like, how does this guy know I have a gun? And I, I go, well, what are you talking about? I don't have a gun. He goes, yes, you do. You have a 38 special. And uh, you were going to try and pawn it. And um, I'm thinking, there's no way he could know that. Especially what kind of gun it is, you know? And I look at him and I go, and he goes, he goes just hear me out. He says, that's what I do. That's my job. I'm a gun collector. But the way he said it, I didn't get the mental image of your typical gun collector. I kind of got the image that... But anyway, so I'm a gun collector. That's what I do. Because I'll give you $130 right now for the gun. And that's exactly what I needed for the bus ticket. And I thought... Okay. So I pulled it out, the gun. I opened up the cylinder, I dropped out the bullets. Yes, I always kept it loaded with me everywhere I went. It was always loaded. My friends out in California were terrified of me. I'd always hear them talk behind my back. Yeah, he keeps it loaded too. But anyway, I popped the shells out, you know, the cartridges, and I put them in my pocket. And then I took my shirt, and I wiped off my fingerprints, because I'm you know, I ain't stupid. A little slow, but I ain't stupid. You know, wiped off the uh, fingerprints and I handed it to him. And he handed me $130. And then he turned around and walked away. And I'm just thinking, did that just really happen? And then I turned around to thank him. And he was gone. He was gone. He literally disappeared. I'm like, no way he could just be gone that quick. And I'm looking around for him everywhere. He literally disappeared. And going back to him saying he was a gun collector, that was his job. You know, if I was more prepared for this video, I'd show you the Bible verse in here where it says, careful what kind of people you entertain. They just might be angels. Yeah, I can relate to John Newton. great sinner saved by the grace of God yeah. thank you for listening to me